Good morning. We request everyone to kindly settle down. Thank you. Good morning. I invite the dignitaries to kindly come onto the stage for a group photo, please. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, request our protocol to kindly escort the dignitaries to their seats. Again, I request everyone to kindly settle down. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. No, not at all, my mouth. Thank you. We will just be starting in a minute. Please settle down. Thank you. Great. Namaste and good morning. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here on a Saturday morning. Welcome to India at 75, showcasing India-UN partnership in action. We would start the event with a short video on this theme. Thank you for your attention. As a founding member of the United Nations, India's unwavering commitment to the values of the UN has left a lasting legacy for generations to come. India's commitment to UN peacekeeping has been steadfast, consistent and long-lasting. Since 1948, India has participated in 51 UN peacekeeping missions 
maintaining peace in some of the most challenging operations around the world. India is playing a leading role in determining the success of the SDGs. Home to one-sixth of humanity, India's model of SDG localization has successfully integrated the 2030 Agenda from national to local governance all the way to individual households. When India grows, the world grows. When India reforms, the world transforms. To ensure faster and transparent delivery of public services using digital means, India has built a first-of-its-kind public digital infrastructure with social benefits worth 300 billion US dollars transferred digitally. India has also made significant contributions in responding to the global pandemic, reinforcing its image as the pharmacy of the world. With over 2 billion vaccine doses administered to date, India's COWIN has formed the backbone for leading the world's largest vaccination drive. Lessons from India's development and social inclusion schemes are adding value to the growth story of many countries. The India-UN Development Partnership Fund, the first ever single country South-South cooperation initiative at the UN, is supporting over 66 projects in 51 countries. The Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program focuses on addressing the needs of 161 partner countries through innovative technological assistance. At COP26, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced India's Panchamrit strategy with ambitious targets for climate action. Initiatives like the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure reflects India's global leadership in ensuring affordable, reliable energy for all and protecting critical infrastructure for sustainable development. Holding true to its ancient philosophy of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. Innovative development solutions from across India are illuminating the path towards a just, equitable, and sustainable development for the region and the world. We thank UN and India for making this video. It is my pleasure now to invite the permanent representative of India, Her Excellency Ms. Richara Kamboj, to present the opening remarks. The Minister of External Affairs of India, Dr. Jay Shankar, Honorable Ministers, the President of the General Assembly, the Deputy Secretary General, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome you to this special event where we celebrate 75 years of our independence, as well as honor our valued partnership with the United Nations. As all of you know, India was among the 50 founding members of the United Nations, the world has changed since then, well, so has India. Our growth story needs no elaboration. Transformative changes are taking place in every sector in the India of today. We are proud of our traditions and confident of our future. Our development model can be encapsulated in three words, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, you will perhaps agree with me that India's transformation cannot be separated from her external context. Our development, economic growth, and security are deeply interconnected to our relations with our partner countries. The reverse is also true. We strongly believe that global prosperity cannot be achieved unless it is shared. Our Prime Minister has said, when India grows, the world grows. Our motto, Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, which reads as together for everyone's growth and with everyone's trust, is reflected in our global partnerships, especially with the South. This cooperation under the South-South Development Framework spans across almost every aspect of human endeavor, 
nutrition, health, education, water, housing, technology, and more. I promise you will hear more of this today. I will also say that India remains firmly committed to multilateralism. We truly believe that the world is one large family. India's commitment to multilateralism is also exemplified through our contribution across the three pillars of the United Nations Charter, peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights. As an elected member of the Security Council now, we continue to endeavor to be a voice of reason and understanding, a voice of the underrepresented developing world and a bridge builder for narrowing divides and in fostering a consensus. We believe that the path to achieve sustainable peace and development is through multilateralism. I will close now, ladies and gentlemen, but not without saying how grateful we are that all of you made time for us today, despite your packed schedules. Thank you. Back to you, Smita. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to now warmly welcome the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Chaba Kuroshi, to address the gathering. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, honorable Ministers, Madam Deputy Secretary General, Ambassadors, dear friends, happy birthday, India family of India. Happy 75, 75th Diamond Jubilee, not to mention the preceding quite a few thousand years of civilization that gave so much to the humankind and keeps inspiring us until today. I sincerely commend the 1.3 billion Indians for the progress that has been made just a three generations time. But I also commend them for their role in creating a better, brighter and more sustainable world. Home to one sixth of humanity India's leadership on global challenges and her strong voice in multilateral affairs have been exemplary. Excellencies, dear friends, we have spent the past week unpacking many interlocking crises in the world faces. We are in the midst of hard and difficult times. The times of paradigm shift because the transformation that we are all seeing have overstepped the limits of mere modification by man. So far, we have not been able to analyze all the system, uh, symptoms of it, but we do already feel that the conditions of a global cooperation have changed. We have entered a new era, a new chapter of history. We live now in a new world, a world of changing challenges, changing roles, and changing ways. One thing is sure, the sustainable de uh, development goals will stay very high on our common agenda. My aim is to move forward with them, to forge successful partnerships, to build bridges between siloed scientific and development agendas, to form new education systems which merge technology with traditional knowledge, to shape new economic models, to reap the benefits of these development agendas. Dear friends, India was one of the first member states to embrace UN Global Goals. And since then, it has worked through its flagship programs at the local, subnational, and national levels to implement the SDGs. India is leading in the field of digital public infrastructure. From building innovative governance systems to citizens-oriented services, the international community has much to learn from you. The partnership between India and the United Nations to accelerate the sustainable development 
including in the remote, remotest villages, is very inspiring. This partnership model can be adapted to be, ap to be ap uh, applied in other countries facing similar challenges. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, science and te technology are key to transformation. They are pillar principles of my presidency as well. The 77th year of the GA is a time to foster truly sustainable relationship between high-tech and traditional forms of knowledge. Transparent scientific indicators and partnerships between governments and science networks are vital to sustainable development. Sustainable solutions grounded in science with solidarity at their core, it is my motto. Dear colleagues, my hope for the 77th session is to be in many ways instrumental in shaping our future, not less than shaping our future. Significant events scheduled on the UN Sustainable Development Calendar will take place throughout this year. The upcoming SDG Summit will be one of the most pivotal events. It will be the occasion to assess and discuss our progress, or sadly, lack of progress, on the development goals. More importantly, however, it will be an opportunity to look for solutions to implement the change we want to see by 2030. The high-level meeting on financing for development will be a time to reflect on our economic approaches towards sustainability and development. In our discussions, I challenge ourselves to rethink how we interpret growth. I should be anchored in solidarity and, uh, and joint interest rather than extraction, profit and selfishness. We have to find the best method of, harn of harness the initiatives of civil society, the voices, voices of youth, and the support of the private sector. My presidency aims to help, uh, help bridge uh, the divide between the global north and global south. Because true transformation will require true cooperation. I'm sure that today's discussions on India's partnership in different sectors and the exchange of experience will be very useful and very lessonful to all of us. Once again, I congratulate India on Azadika Amrit, her Diamond Jubilee, and I thank you. I thank the President of the General Assembly for his valuable remarks. It is my honor now to invite uh, the External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, to deliver the address. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Your presence is appreciated, especially at this time of the morning. This year, India turns 75, and we have a story to tell. In the 18th century, India accounted for about a quarter of the global GDP. By the middle of the 20th, colonialism ensured that we were one of the poorest nations of the world. That was our state when we became a founding member of the United Nations. But in the 75th year of its independence, India stands before you proudly as the fifth biggest economy of the world and still rising, as the strongest, most enthusiastic, and definitely the most argumentative democracy. Our development rests on an expansive 
digital public infrastructure designed to promote that no one is left behind. In recent days, digital technology has successfully advanced our food safety net to 800 million Indians. More than $300 billion of benefits have been distributed digitally. 400 million people get food regularly and we have administered over 2 billion vaccinations. And the secret of that is indeed digital. India today envisions itself as a developed country by 2047, 100 years of our independence. We dream of digitizing our most remote villages and landing on the moon, perhaps even digitizing it. Friends, our foundational belief is that India's own development is inseparable from that of the rest of the world. Without doubt, our progress and growth has also benefited from our interface with the United Nations and its agencies. India, as you all know, was a founding member of the UN. And as we mark 75 years of freedom, we also celebrate 75 years of our partnership with the UN. The India-UN Development Partnership Fund is particularly symbolic of this relationship because it is the first ever single country South-South initiative at the UN. It currently extends to 66 development projects in 51 countries. Today, you will hear some of these stories from our colleagues. Our multifaceted partnership with the UN is significantly reflected in the area of peacekeeping. We have contributed over the years more than a quarter million personnel to this effort, more than any other country. But it would be best if you heard that from others about the difference that we have made to peacekeeping. India has also enabled two major initiatives for global climate action. The first is the International Solar Alliance, which India pioneered with France in 2015 on the sidelines of COP21. Today, it has over 100 members. The second is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, in which India is the founder member. At the COP26 last year, we helped to launch further initiatives under these two platforms, like the One Sun, One World, One Grid, Green Grids Initiative, and the Infrastructure for Resilient Island States Initiative. Excellencies, the COVID pandemic is an unprecedented global crisis. When needed, we responded first with vaccines for our friends in Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, and our own neighborhood. I'm delighted that there will be others who will share their perspective on this subject. The conflict in Ukraine has aggravated food and energy inflation to make it one of the biggest challenges of our times. India has responded by supplying food grains, including as grant assistance in recent years to Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Yemen, and several countries in Africa. It is important that we hear from those who have joined us today on the criticality of food security. Friends, we believe that development is a public good. Open sourcing is the best way forward. India believes that UN can be an even bigger force multiplier in advancing SDGs by pooling global knowledge. So let me conclude by reiterating that India stands committed, it stands ready to strengthen its partnerships with the United Nations to ensure a brighter future for the planet. We have full faith in the principles of the United Nations in its charter and in our belief in reformed multilateralism as key to shared goals of the world. The world, in our view, is one family. Your presence today reaffirms that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, for your address. I would like to invite now the UN Deputy Secretary General, Her Excellency Ms. Amina Mohammed, to read out the message from UN Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres. Uh, good morning, everyone. Your Excellency, our External Affairs Minister from India, um, our President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank our permanent representative for organizing the India-UN SDG Partnership High Level event, and I'm now pleased to read the message on behalf of the Secretary General. Over the last 75 years, India has achieved remarkable progress in equitable and sustainable development, lifting over 270 million people out of extreme poverty and rising to become the world's fifth largest economy. All sectors of society have been positively impacted. First, in health. Since 1951, life expectancy has risen from 32 to 69.7 today, and polio was eradicated. Second, education. The number of universities has grown from 20 at independence to over 1,000 today. The literacy rate has also risen from 18.3% in 1951 to 74% in 2011. Third, food security. In the last 30 years, India transitioned from being a food deficit nation to a self-sufficient food producing country. Fourth, on poverty. The number of multidimensional poor was reduced by half in the last 10 years. And fifth, in climate change, India currently has one of the largest installed solar capacities in the world. Looking ahead, India, home to the largest youth generation in history, will be decisive in the success of the Sustainable Development Goals. And reiterating Prime Minister Modi, as you reform, the world transforms. We're fast approaching the midpoint of the time available to reach the SDGs. Yet we must be honest that our assessment progress is in peril. Even the most fundamental goals on poverty, hunger, and education are going in reverse. And we can see consequences everywhere from the escalating climate chaos and humanitarian emergencies to rising inequalities and injustices. So we must change course, and we can. The 2030 Agenda for Development remains our compass to guide us to a more peaceful and prosperous future that leaves no one behind. But we need to act together in solidarity with greater ambition, urgency. And we need to act in partnership across government, civil society, the private sector, and from the global to the local levels. Rooted in a shared belief in multilateral solutions, the India-UN SDG partnership is a powerful example of cooperation that we can move forward. As India assumes the presidency of the G20, we count on you to mobilize credible actions to deliver on the 2030 Agenda, Addis Ababa Agreement, and the Paris Agreement. Thank you for your leadership and commitment to a better world for all. That ends the SG's message, so while I've got the podium, on a personal note. <laughs> India has inspired with its diverse society, energized by its youthful population, its strong democracy, and I must say, seeing firsthand women in peacekeeping. The huge and growing potential to transform the world, the scale and pace of growth charts a path for others to follow. India's partnerships in business with women the GDP and the creativity industry brings to life the reality of our SDGs in everyone's lives. Transformations in food systems, sustainable energy, connectivity, and health are going to be key opportunities for deepening the partnership. The current crises we have, be it the recovery from COVID or the climate crisis or the impacts from the Ukraine war, what we have is never been more endowed and able to face those crises together. And the UN development system looks forward not only to deepening the activities with the SDG fund, but also to accompany you on 2030 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Secretary General, for your remarks. And we also extend, of course, our gratitude to UNSG for his support and kind words of encouragement. We do understand that some of our dignitaries uh, have to leave now uh, for attending other engagements. And of course, we thank uh, the President of the General Assembly and the Deputy Secretary General for joining us today. And now, 
request um, our UNDP administrator, Mr. Akim Steiner, to present his remarks. His Excellency Dr. S. Jai Shankar, the Minister of External Affairs, Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, allow me to begin for just one minute with a personal note because I was looking at that number 75 and then I began calculating because for more than half of India's post-independence life and freedom in shaping its own development pathways, I have had the privilege of actually being a student and a companion to it because when I graduated in 1983, I uh, got on a plane, flew all the way to New Delhi, took a train for two days to Tamil Nadu through Chirapali, and began to wonder uh, where I was going to end up because I had chosen to do an apprenticeship with a local organization in a small village called Vidutalaipuram in Tamil Nadu. And as you spoke, Excellency, um, and you described that journey that India has taken, it, I think, has, as for so many of us who have worked in development, been continuously both a source of inspiration and also of orientation. Because as you said, where India began from that journey after independence, where it had to not only choose a form of political dispensation, but also a development trajectory that from the beginning always had those that we in today's Agenda 2030 refer to as leave no one behind, were actually the focus of India's development efforts. Nothing in life is perfect. India's journey has also been one with many breakthroughs, sometimes setbacks. But I think if you just look at the extraordinary achievements that have been made, including, for instance, when just um, a few years ago, the research showed that between 2005 and 2015, India managed to lift over 270 million people out of poverty, over a quarter of a billion people. And that journey has continued and I'm sure the numbers will continue to show that. The rise in per capita income between 1990 and 2021 of 268%. And life expectancy at birth having increased by 8.6 years between 1990 and 2021. These are numbers, but behind each of these numbers lie literally tens of millions of lives that have been changed by development choices and decisions that have been taken by leaders, but also by civil society by the private sector, by entrepreneurs in India, which makes your journey such a, a platform for all of us to continuously observe and learn from it. The United Nations as a family has been a part of India's journey for decades. UNDP equally so, and we continue to be an extremely proud partner. And we do so particularly against the backdrop of what last weeks or 10 days ago when we launched the Human Development Report was an acute reminder that development progress cannot only go in one direction. Yes, we've had some extraordinary decades, in fact, over three decades of development progress that have been remarkable. And the Human Development Index has, in a sense, tried to capture those also beyond GDP and to look at education, at life expectancy, essentially at the quality of life for people. India's journey in that Human Development Index has also been remarkable and is reflected in it. And yet, as we meet here in September at this 77th session of the UN General Assembly, we're also looking for the first time in 30 years at two consecutive years of the Human Development Index declining. This has never happened before in 30 years. It is a reminder of quite how acute and how volatile our development progress as a human family is, but also as a community of nations. But as you said, Excellency, today after a week of many sobering and yes, sometimes um, tough moments in our international conversation and, and dialogue, let us also celebrate something which is that which brings us together, namely the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, India's commitment as um, a nation that is not only investing in its own development but also in the development of others. And I think we as UNDP have been very proud to have accompanied India on some of the great breakthroughs that you have brought both to your national development but increasingly is also um, of direct relevance to other countries' decisions. Just a simple fact, real-time data to tackle poverty. 
it is so crucial if you really want to target and find those who are being left behind. The aspirational districts program, which um, I consider to be one of those very deliberate decisions to go and find those who have been left behind and then invest in their ability to change their future. The National SDG Index, the National Multidimensional Poverty Index, all of these parts of India's way of focusing on those who need help in order to be able to succeed. The whole digital frontier that you have been driving, not only through the Art Hub program, but also by being a part of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, the International Solar Alliance, South-South and Triangular Corporation, the India-UN Partnership Development Fund, all of these tools that both have emanated from the needs of a country looking at its own development and then being able to also invest in the international community. I don't want to take more of your time simply to say that as the United Nations Development Program, we are proud to be working with so many Indian institutions, partners in government, but also in academia, in the civil society sector, the private sector, on maturing solutions that ultimately will not only benefit the citizens of India, but indeed the citizens of the world. And here I go beyond just looking at developing countries, because some of the innovations that you are helping to bring to the international community are sometimes as relevant to any citizen on this planet, International Solar Alliance just being one example. So as you also begin to focus on your G20 presidency, I hope that you can infuse into that vital forum, not a parallel universe, but a vital forum to let our international financial institutions, our international political institutions, lead more effectively in times of crisis that link between the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, and our common fate. I wish you all the best, and particularly in this Diamond Jubilee year. Thank you so much. I thank the UNDP Administrator for a statement. We would now proceed to the next segment of the event. As underscored by the dignitaries, India's approach to the achievement of Sustainable Development Goals is based on strong understanding of the interdependence of the SDGs and participative collaboration. This collaboration is reflected in India's overall international development partnership that has expanded significantly in recent years, both in geographical reach as well as in areas of cooperation. Today we have amongst us partner countries to share their developmental experiences with India, spanning various sectors from pandemic management and health to climate action and food security. During the COVID-19 pandemic, India has reinforced its image as the pharmacy of the world. It is my privilege to invite the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Antigua and Barbuda, His Excellency, Mr. Evely Paul Sheth Green, to talk on pandemic in management. Uh, thank you very kindly, Madam Chair. His Excellency, Dr. Shankar, the External Affairs Minister of India, colleague foreign ministers, other UN high officials, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps I should start where the last speaker ended by extending happy birthday to India. It is indeed an honor this morning for me and a privilege to speak at this very important engagement designed to recognize 75 years of India's participation and partnership with the United Nations and to brainstorm on a framework to ensure the effective management of COVID-19 beyond 2022. Again, I take the opportunity to extend congratulations to India as it continues to commemorate 75 years of hard work, determination and desire to grow the social and economic well-being of its citizens. As a founding member of this August body, designed to achieve international cooperation and to solve economic, social, and humanitarian problems, India continues today to demonstrate its support to the principles enshrined 
in the UN Charter to active support and involvement. As a country, India has become a great example of a very impressive social and economic growth story. It's gained successes from agricultural production to nuclear and space technology, from affordable health healthcare to world-class educational institutions, biotechnology, giant steel plants, and information technology power. India's response to Antigua and Barbuda to the Caribbean following the onset of COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021 is testimony to the significance of President Modi's call for what he termed One Earth, One Health. That call represents a global solidarity, a call for global solidarity and alliance building to manage the pandemic for the future survival of all citizens. Like a hurricane, the coronavirus pandemic swept across the globe, claiming lives and battering economies. The economic fallout from the pandemic has left long-term scars amongst the most vulnerable segments of our societies. Many have had to contend with the loss of employment prospects and a reduction in the standards of living. Like most countries, our resilience was tested, tested in ways we could never imagine. And while the call for enhanced cooperation may sound like a lofty foreign policy goal or diplomatic rhetoric, the crisis revealed just how much we need cooperation to protect our citizens, our countries, and our world. During the pandemic, we witnessed the best of generosity and cooperation, namely South-South cooperation. India, through its international cooperation initiatives, was the first, the very first country to provide Antigua and Barbuda with much needed vaccines. Additionally, through the UN partnership agencies, we also received ventilators, and other medical equipment and materials that serve to save the lives of many Antiguans and Barbudans. The COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access, COVAX facility, provided much needed access of, to vaccines that further enhanced my country's ability to be the first Caribbean country to achieve the WHO target of vaccinating 70% of our population. There is no doubt that the contributions of developing countries and developed states to the UN systems, WHO, PAHO, and regional institutions like CARICOM and the Caribbean Public Health Agency must be commended for helping Antigua and Barbuda and the rest of the Caribbean to be safe spaces for citizens and visitors alike. The epidemiology of SARS, infection according to WHO, continues to be unpredictable as the virus evolves. It is therefore critical for the nations of the world to continue our public health efforts to promote the use of vaccines as the most effective and efficacious way to prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and death. The continued implementation of public health social measures designed to reduce transmission will be an important approach for global community to embrace going forward. The need for continued cooperation through the work of the WHO and regional bodies like CARICOM and the respective regional UN agencies will certainly help to ensure the dissemination of credible, accurate, and reliable preventative measures. The continued building of capacity among developing countries to produce and distribute distribute vaccines will certainly strengthen and enhance our effort to effectively manage the pandemic. In closing, and in saying thanks, the world today joins in saying happy birthday to India and thanks for your global contributions to humanity. I thank you. Thank you, sir. I now invite His Excellency 
Mr. Hugh Hilton Todd, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Guyana. Over to you, sir. Foreign Minister and colleague of India, other colleague foreign ministers within CARICOM and beyond, ambassadors, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Guyana's story is very simple. We live in a globalized world, hyper-globalization, where politics and economics have globalized the world, driven by technology and migration. When we assess India's development post-independence, we can see that India has been fit for purpose at every stage of its development. In some cases, outstripping the multilateral institutions in terms of its commitment and its understanding of a rules-based system. Small countries like Guyana would have benefited immensely from India's growth trajectory because India has always been an economy that focused on human development, putting human ahead of any other form of development. And that has been very, very commendable. And we in Guyana celebrate with India. And Excellency, you know that uh, in Guyana, if you come to Guyana, you'll find that the Indian culture, in some cases, has not changed since the, the indentured laborers came in the, in the 19th century. So you can see, still see some of the Indian culture preserved, um, which is astounding. And you can, you can reference, cross-reference that with the High Commission in Guyana, Shinivasa right now, who's having a sterling good time um, getting immersed in the Indian culture during the celebrations. And uh, we find that very, very exciting. But more importantly, when we were faced with the, the COVID pandemic, it was a time of unknown for politicians across the globe. And I can recall us having meetings with the Minister of Health. And he would often refer to literature coming out of India. And I can see people thinking, well, what are we doing? And he was very focused. I myself began reading literature coming out of India in terms of their advancement, and I must commend India and the government for the transparency within which they, they operated in terms of bringing um, the message of their progress to the rest of the world. And we were very sure and certain that we were going to take vaccines coming out of India, AstraZeneca. We were very gung-ho on that. And we made that decision very early. And when you look at the commitment that India would have made to the rest of the world, and in the case of Guyana, and the attention to detail that the office representing the government of India in Guyana, the High Commissioner, the High Commission and the High Commissioner and staff, warm, friendly, provided hope for the people of Guyana. And the delivery was made good. The promise was made good. And it is very touching because this is a country that is not just the fifth largest economy in the world, but is the largest economy in terms of its heart, compassion, its humility, its respect for humanity, and putting lives ahead of profits. Now that is what is important for us as a global population. So when you look at the multilateralism and why multilateralism were, was established, it was really to create peace, stability, 
and the prosperity. And if you look at India's model, and by the way, India has to take care of 1.3 billion people in a democracy with smooth transitions. Can you imagine having to take care of 1.3 billion people and still having the time at the policy level to say, let us look to see what we can do for the rest of the world. When multilateral institutions should be doing that. So I will dare say that India is a multilateral institution in its own right. In its own right. When you think about their commitment to humanity and you think about their, uh, about their progress, and not only the promise, but the commitments that they make, they're all in line with a with rules-based system. So the leadership that India is providing, the commitment to leaving no one behind, is aligned with all of the principles, global principles. So India, obviously, is providing leadership at a global governance level, and that is commendable for one country, 75 years old. Think about it, in our lifetime, we have industrialized economies that were never colonized, some who were colonized centuries old in terms of their post-independence, but you don't get the same attitude and commitment and conviction as you can get from India. And when you think about the pandemic and how India managed its public policy and health, it's astonishing. We borrowed from that, and we were able to also keep our economies going, to ensure that we provided hope, and obviously using a lot of the literature coming out of India because we don't have the capacity. So the donation of 500,000 vaccines to the Caribbean of which Guyana got 80,000, 10% of our population. Maybe as it may seem small in number, but it made a big impact in terms of our public health. So on behalf of His Excellency the President, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali and the people of Guyana, Excellency, I want to thank you and the, gov the government and people of India for your generous generosity and your commitment to service, not only to the people of India, but to humanity as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks, uh, Mr. Minister. And now invite the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jamaica, Her Excellency Ms. Kamina Johnson-Smith. Your Excellency and indeed our good friend, Dr. Jai Shankar, other colleague ministers, ambassadors, senior officials, and specially invited guests. Good morning. It is an honor to join you this morning in acknowledgement of the remarkable contributions made by India as we reflect on its 75 years of independence and its founding membership of the United Nations. I feel especially privileged to be doing so because for 60 of these 75 years, Jamaica and India have enjoyed a deep and abiding friendship buttressed by the formal establishment of diplomatic relations in August 1962, the same month and year in which we gained our independence. We celebrate together with all of you this morning India's hallmarks of mutual respect, equality, and mutual benefit and peaceful coexisting between individuals and countries. Over the seven and a half decades since its independence, India has been guided by these principles in navigating global challenges. The cascading and interlocking challenges we face today are being exacerbated by or have their genesis in the COVID-19 pandemic. Jamaica, nor any of us indeed, Jamaica was not spared from the fallout including a drastic decline in the tourism industry and in overall economic activity, as well as increased unemployment and, of course, myriad social consequences. Not least was the pressure on our healthcare system. Thankfully, we have made significant progress through programs implemented by the government, as well as through the unwavering support 
of partners at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels. From the very outset, the Republic of India was a reliable partner and friend whose assistance was critical to our pandemic response. Despite its own challenges and responsibilities, as just elucidated by our colleague Hugh, enabled by its advanced pharmaceutical capacity, India embraced a holistic and outward-looking vaccine diplomacy strategy. As a result, Jamaica was able to secure its first life-saving vaccines from India. While others chose to withhold supplies, India's vaccine outreach exemplified its principles of equality and mutual benefit. We are deeply grateful and remain so to the government and people of India, led by His Excellency Sri Narendra Modi and indeed our friend Dr. Jai Shankar. Jamaica's vaccination program effectively got off the ground with the receipt from India of 50,000 doses of COVID shield vaccines on March 10, 2021. Were it not for India's uncompromised willingness to respond to our urgent need, our progress in these initial phases would not have been possible, quite simply. I've never felt as impotent as a foreign minister as those days when seeking vaccines. And when we spoke, minister, I recall the sense of hope which existed and which I was able to convey to my cabinet. We will never forget. India also donated a wide range of medicines and supplies towards Jamaica's COVID response. Jamaica is pleased that other brother and sister countries within CARICOM also benefited similarly from, from the generosity of the government and people of India. In fact, India is to be lauded for supplying over 240 million doses of vaccines to over 100 countries and for completing almost 2 billion vaccine doses. I'm also reminded that India was the first country to donate vaccines in early 2021 to protect the UN blue helmets. Excellencies, as we strive to make pandemic man management more efficient and to build future capacity for what may come, I am pleased that India has offered to make its core win, winning against COVID-19 platform available to interested countries. There is the potential to benefit from India's innovative approach to standardize schedule, track, trace, and validate vaccination. For our part, we have developed a platform to digitize our vaccine certificates. And like you, we believe there's always scope for us to all share best practices and lessons learned. It's important that we build on these experiences and maximize them for the greater good. It is indeed encouraging that India has also not forgotten the cross-cutting issue of development cooperation which impacts climate resilience and developmental goals of many countries as we seek to attain the SDGs. Jamaica will now start its first sustainable economic recovery project supported by the Government of India through the very UN Partnership Development Fund mentioned earlier, wherein the people of a rural community in our most la populated parish will benefit from cross-cutting developmental assistance to the tune of US $1 million. The International Solar Alliance, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, the IRIS program, Infrastructure for Resilient Island States initiatives, the International Development Assistance Scheme, and of course, the almost 60-year-old ITEC program continue to radiate strong rays of South-South cooperation optimism to Jamaica and many of our countries, supporting in practical ways our road to 2030. India truly reinforces the principles of multilateralism as reflected in the Charter to pursue international cooperation in providing solutions to international problems. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Jamaica remains sincerely appreciative of the instrumental role played by India in assisting us in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. We actually carry vaccine matri within us and we will therefore never forget this time of friendship during this time of crisis. Minister Jai Shankar, your country can be justifiably proud of its achievements over so many years of cooperation with the international community. Please accept my best wishes and indeed the wishes of our Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, and the people of Jamaica as we extend best wishes to India as you continue to inspire hope and benefit humanity. I thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Moving on to another critical area of cooperation, water. Allow me to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Liberata Mula Mula, Minister of Foreign Affairs and East African Cooperation of Tanzania. Uh, Your Excellency and dear colleague uh, and Minister for External Affairs, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar. Uh, Your Excellency, the Administrator of UNDP, Akim Steiner. Excellencies, Foreign Ministers of different countries here present, Ambassadors, dear friends and colleagues, good morning to you all. I greet you in the name of the United Republic of Tanzania. As we say in Swahili, na wasalimu kwa jina la jamuri ya mungano wa Tanzania. Asante sana. I also bring women power in the room. Good morning. <laughs> I thank you. Honorable Minister Jai Shankar for inviting me to participate in celebrating your 75th anniversary of India's independence. I'm excited, as you can see, to be among the friends of India. When I received your invitation, Your Excellency, I did not hesitate to say yes. I said yes because Tanzanians value our excellent bilateral relations. We have come a long way. I also thought I would miss this occasion because I was supposed to celebrate this Independence Day in Tanzania. But thank you for organizing this in the margins of our UNGA. Excellency, let me say, as I join you in celebrating India's economic milestones and progress, let me say, Badayan, congratulations. <laughs> Before I continue, let me also extend fraternal greetings from my Excellency Samia Sulu Hassan, President of the United Republic of Tanzania, and from the people of Tanzania to our sister, our Excellency Drupad Murmu, President of the Republic of India, and of course the friendly people of India as you celebrate your 75th anniversary of the Republic of India. I was um, so delighted during the funeral of Her Majesty the Queen, the two leaders, women leaders were captured, it was my president and your, your president, Excellency Drupad. Mum, as I said, we bring power to the room. Excellencies, Tanzania and India enjoy more than 60 years of cordial relations and cooperation built by our founding fathers of our two nations, the late Mwalim Julius Kambarage Nyerere and of course the Mahatma Gandhi. Our two countries have been, of course, initiated a number of economic reforms and progress alongside the international political and economic relations. We have developed our international business linkages and inward foreign investment. But let me say, our countries seem to agree on everything. <laughs> we see eye to eye on many issues we share the commitment to anti-colonialism, non-alignment, as well as we have been promoting our South-South cooperation international fora, and now we share a lot on issues in combating climate change, SDGs, supporting refugees. Of course, you have been supporting us during this pandemic. And of course, we work hand in hand in maintaining global peace. We participate together in various peacekeeping 
uh, peacekeeping operations around the world. But at the national level, at the bilateral level, we are gratified that Tans India is among the largest trading partner of our country, accounting for 16% of Tanzania's foreign trade. And India is the country's third largest investor in Tanzania. Looking ahead, I'm confident our partnership will continue to grow to greater heights. Now, let me speak to what I've been asked to speak about. And this is water and the health sector. As they say, water is life. So as I mentioned, we have had excellent cooperation in this sector. Water and health is a model of South-South cooperation. Our cooperation in these two sectors contributes to our efforts to achieve two major and key sustainable development goals. Goal three, I don't know if you can locate it there, it's about health and well-being. And goal six, which is about clean water and sanitation. It also contributes, of course, to our implementation, to the implementation of our vision 2025. On water management, our partnership, excellence, as you know, is through the Indian line of credit, we call it LOC, which improves water supply and sanitation for many Tanzanians. This new approach addresses a root problem which we appreciate. Of course, in the interest of time, I cannot go through all the major projects that have been financed. We have projects that range from $178 million which we expected by end of the year will be able to be delivered. We have even projects extending the Lake Victoria. We have had this Lake Victoria, and it is named after King Victoria, but we had not made use of it. But uh, India came out with the Lake Victoria pipeline linking major cities and regions in Tanzania. This century, we have signed an agreement to construct $500 million worth of water supply system in 28 Tanzanian towns, and implementation is about to start. Now, in the health sector, our cooperation is very strong, and I can give examples few from 20, 2011 to 2022. Our Minister of Health signed six memorandum of understandings with hospitals and health institutions in India on improved patient treatment, exchange programs for in-service training, attachment and research, care for disabled people, and more than artificial limbs. I know we are limited to time, I can go on and on, but Excellencies, allow me just to recall what our head of delegation said when he addressed the General Assembly two days ago. In his speech, he said, the key lessons we have learned from COVID-19 pandemic is that the world needs better national and global health system to handle future pandemics in cooperation with each and every one. So I therefore conclude by thanking India once again for contributing to our preparedness for the pandemic, especially investing more in building health infrastructure and beefing up the health workforce as well as enhancing our national capacity to manufacture drugs, supply of vaccines and medical equipment. Let me end here by thanking you and let me say namaste. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency, for bringing more energy into this room. An important aspect of uh, India's leadership in climate action is converting domestic action into international collaboration. To elaborate on this, I now invite Minister of Foreign Affairs of Maldives, His Excellency, Mr. Abdullah Shahid.
His Excellency Dr. Jay Shankar, Minister of External Affairs of India, dear colleague foreign ministers, ambassadors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, I warmly extend the Maldives' congratulations to India on their 75th anniversary of independence and its productive partnership with the United Nations. Sanyukt Rashtur Kesat Sajdari Par Bharat Ko Badai. This partnership's success testifies to the priority India gives to meeting the 2030 Agenda and of their commitment to positively engaging with the international multilateral system. The Maldives counts on the leadership of India at the multilateral fora to advance progress in important spheres. From our national experience, India has been a valuable partner in helping meet challenges from disaster relief to addressing the pandemic and accessing vaccines to economic development and recovery. We note that even during the most difficult days of the pandemic, despite their own challenges, India made a remarkable effort to help the Maldives and much of the global south, as we have heard this morning repeatedly. We especially appreciate their support in the sphere of climate change, especially in adaptation. Currently, India has partnered with Maldives in establishing safe and secure water and sewerage facilities across 34 islands. This is to counter the climate change induced water shortages evident across the Maldives every year. These efforts have benefited us immensely at the national level. Excellencies, Maldives remains inspired by the leaps and bounds made by India in the multilateral sphere over the past seven decades. On the climate front, the in International Solar Alliance spearheaded by India has garnered the support of 121 countries. During the 76th session, the Alliance gained observer status in the General Assembly at a meeting I had the privilege of presiding. We note that this further strengthened its ability to contribute to work for efficient consumption of solar energy to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. As a country that is committed to reducing carbon emissions at the national level and to becoming a net zero country by 2030, we applaud these advances. We express our hope that other countries will emulate the examples and make investments into climate-friendly technologies. Another initiative I would like to highlight is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit. Designed as a partnership between countries, UN agencies, multilateral development banks, the private sector, and academic institutions, it aims to promote promote disaster resilient infrastructure. As a climate vulnerable country that is vulnerable to external shocks, the Maldives welcomes researching, investing, and designing resilient infrastructure. India's actions throughout have demonstrated its solidarity with the Global South. As we move into COP27 and beyond, I'm confident that we can count on India's support in rallying financing, technical know-how, and support for the cause of all developing countries and vulnerable countries such as small island developing states. Excellencies, dear friends, the Maldives applauds the strides that India continues to make in the multilateral sphere and will continue to work alongside our neighbor, our close partner, and our best friend to solve the challenges that face humanity. Azadi Kam Amrit Mahasava. I think. Thank you, Your Excellency. We would now like to play a video message from the Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France, Her Excellency Ms. Catherine Colonna, also underlining climate partnership. Dear Minister Jai Shankar, Dear colleagues and friends, I had to fly back to Paris yesterday, but I really wanted to say a few words. Since its launch in 2018 by Prime Minister Modi and President Macron, France has been very proud 
to co-chair the International Solar Alliance with India. We've come a long way in a very short time. 107 states have already signed the framework agreement and 87 have ratified it. Our Solar Alliance is active on the ground and expands its programs worldwide. Last week in India, together with Dr. Jay Shankar, we announced that three more countries will benefit from it, Bhutan, Papua New Guinea, and Senegal. Our efforts with India are not restricted to solar energy, of course. We share the same conviction that reassessing our ways of living is paramount to reach the goals we collectively set since the Paris Conference in 2015. This is why I'm convinced that the LIFE initiative proposed by Prime Minister Modi could be a game changer. We look forward to working with India to make it one more success in the perspective of the Indian presidency at the G20 next year. On this note, I thank you all for your commitment and thank Dr. Jai Shankar for giving me the opportunity to deliver this message. Thank you. We thank uh, the French Foreign Minister for her message. Uh, we have heard several times today of the India-UNDP uh, UN uh, Development Partnership Fund. Uh, I would like to now welcome uh, His Excellency Dr. Mamadou Tangara, Foreign Minister of the Gambia, to share his views on how this is directly impacting the lives of communities. Your Excellency Dr. Jai Shankar, Minister of External Affairs of India, uh, dear colleagues here present, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the invitation to attend this auspicious occasion on the celebration of India's 75th independence anniversary, as well as the historical friendship and partnership that our two countries continue to enjoy. This has been a remarkable journey of resilience, global solidarity, development, and success. This independent celebration of India brings joyful memories of our historic friendship and a renewed devotion to the further strengthening of our long-standing relations founded on compassion, solidarity, respect, and mutual prosperity. Over the past decades, the substance of our bilateral ties have been characterized by the exchanges of educational, political, social, and economic partnership between our two governments. As a strategic development partner, the government of India is assured of our strong support and true friendship for the advancement of our two countries. This friendship is anchored on shared values that encourage our unwavering commitment to nurturing mutual growth with a view to strengthening relations and deepening cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the strong bilateral relations enjoyed by our two countries is further boosted by India's catalytic role in fostering South-South cooperation across the developing world. India's contribution in this regard further strengthened the push for the attainment of the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. India's unique and historic role in championing attainment of global development goals, including the SDGs, has revitalized hope among members of the group of 77 and China and the group of least developing countries. It is for this renewed hope that the government of the Gambia is on the verge of launching its new green recovery focused national development plan aimed at recovering from the devastating circumstances imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic and the global economic downturn. To achieve this ambitious national development plan, the Gambia will require solid international cooperation and genuine partnerships in order to attain the goals of the Agenda 2030 SD, SDGs goal. As a beneficiary of the India-UN Development Partnership Fund, 
we are pleased to see India's rekindle on sovereign commitment to nurturing the partnership, a partnership that continues to provide sustainable development within the framework of South-South cooperation. Through the partnership projects, the National Disaster Management Agency of the Gambia was able to access $1.2 million through India's UN Partnership Office for its use of drones and early warning system of pre- and post-flood disaster management. The project is contributing to poverty alleviation by increasing flood resilience through the establishment of a people-centered early warning system. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Gambia continues to face capacity gaps in early warning system to be better prepared for the reduction of the impact of this climate change hazard. We commend the government of India for its generosity in placing such a useful facility at the disposal of countries from the developing south. It could be recalled that since its inception, the fund has created a great window of opportunity benefiting 37 countries in areas geared towards achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Undoubtedly, the complementarity and practical nature of the fund makes it an exemplary model for fostering South-South partnership. The successful implementation of the fund's project in the Gambia will ensure our national preparedness to mitigate and avoid flood disasters. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, India has contributed significantly to the Gambia's infrastructural development through various concessional lines of credit and other development funding worth millions of dollars. India's support has also contributed immensely to meeting the capacity development and manpower needs of the Gambia through scholarships and training programs. We are truly grateful for your friendship and true partnership. We will continue to explore with you new ways of development cooperation with a view to achieving the goals of our national development plan. I am pleased to once again convey the appreciation of the government and people of the Gambia for the invaluable friendship and partnership we have fostered and nurtured over the years. We look forward to renew commitments and engagement for the advancement of our peoples. Happy Independence Anniversary, Shukriya. Thank you, Your Excellency. I would like to now invite the PR of Timor Leste to read out a message by the Foreign Minister, Her Excellency Ms. Adeljaiza Albertina Xavier Reish Magna. Honorable Minister Dr. Jaiskar, I would like to thank India Permanent Representative to convey this uh, showcase partnership. On behalf of my Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation and Government of Timor Leste, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to participate this showcase in India UN Partnership in Action. The fund is abs abs ob abs absolutely effective on supporting people in least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, intending to help those left farthest behind and to raise them first. Timor Leste, one of the beneficiaries of the partnership between India and UN. In 2019, the enclave of Ekusi the Special Economy Zone of Timor Leste Social Market was selected for the project of IPC through the UNDP and it was concluded in 2021. The general objective is to improve primary and secondary education by providing children and young people in Ekusi with ICT skills and knowledge. 
Timor-Leste is grateful and appreciates for the project with the leveraging ICT to improve education and skills in Timor-Leste. The budget allocated for this project was around one million US dollar to UNDP. The project was successfully concluded and benefited thousands of the students in Ekusi. Besides this project, in early this year, the Indian government also donated 50k tons of rice to the civil protection of Timor-Leste. Timor-Leste is convinced that this project will strengthen the South-South cooperation and at the same time support South-owned and led, the main driving and transformational sustainable development project across the world. To conclude, we would like to reiterate our sincere gratitude for project implementation in ECUSI and reason that this initiative will be extended to other regions in Timor-Leste and be multiplied across the globe. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. India has a long and distinguished history of being associated with UN peacekeeping, and I uh, now welcome uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ionish Kashulaitis, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cyprus, to share his views on cooperation in this area. Excellency, the Minister of External Affairs of India, dear friend, Dr. Jay Shankar, Your Excellency, colleagues, Minister for Foreign Affairs, other officials, and ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be here today to celebrate such a significant milestone for a country with which we share deep-rooted bonds of friendship, a parallel history, and whose continuous and unwavering solidarity has always been greatly appreciated. I would like to express my heartfelt congratulations on the 75th anniversary of your independence. When Secretary General Teres de Guellar accepted the Nobel Prize for Peace in December 1988 on behalf of the UN's peacekeeping mission, he stated that the peacekeeping operations symbolize the world community's will to peace and represent the impartial, practical expression of that will. He called peacekeepers the servants of peace. Given that peacekeeping introduced the principles of nonviolence to the realm of conflict and tension, and military forces were deployed to prevent war rather than instigate it. The use of this term is very pertinent. Indians' involvement in U.S. peacekeeping operations has been recognized by all of us. India has been one of the countries which contributed to the, which has contributed the most servants of peace. Since 1948, more than 250,000 Indian citizens have served in 49 UN peacekeeping missions. Today, more than 6,700 troops from India are deployed in missions worldwide. It is a unique combination of being the world's largest democracy, coupled with its strong tradition of respect to the rule of law, has rendered India a very significant addition to any peacekeeping effort. This has been evident since its very first participation in the UN peacekeeping operation in Korea 
in, in the 1950s. During that period, India's mediatory role led to the signing of the armistice that ended the Korean War. India's democratic disposition became even more apparent in 2007 when it became the first country to send an all-female contingent to UN peacekeeping missions. Moreover, India has also the first country to contribute to the trust fund set up in 2016 on sexual exploitation and abuse in peacekeeping missions. As Cypriots, we have been fortunate to have three Indian UN peacekeeping mission in Cyprus during the period of 1964 to 1976. That was very crucial and very difficult for our country. General Gianni, General Timaya, and General Devan Prem Chad, whose tireless efforts during the Turkish invasion to protect civilians, ensure the evacuation of foreign diplomatic staff, and safeguard the airport in Nicosia will never be forgotten. General Timaya died in the line of duty from natural causes in Cyprus, and his name is given to one of the biggest uh, avenues in Larnaca. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said that nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. If we take this as a given, then UN peacekeeping operations and the individuals who are deployed in them become important vessels in the establishment and enforcement of international law and justice. I believe I speak on behalf of everyone who, when I express our sincere gratitude to all troop contributing countries and to every individual member of these peacekeeping open missions whose sacrifices are making I, our world a more humane place. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. An area where India has collaborated with partner countries during challenging times is food security. Please welcome His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Awad bin Mubarak, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates Affairs of Yemen, to share his insights on this. Dr. Jay Shankar, Minister of Foreign Affairs of India, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me at, out, at the outset to congratulate India on its 75th independence anniversary and extend my sincere thanks to the government of India and my dear friend for hosting this timely and important event. I cannot speak without mentioning that I born and re raised up in Aden. Uh, which is a city uh, has a very special uh, relationship with India. You cannot find in this city a single corner that doesn't has any of the Indian uh, symbols. In my neighborhood, always when I saw the Indian temple, that reminded me with the very special uh, relationship that we have, and how uh, most of the you know citizens in this city whom many of them have Indian roots, live together with the rest of the citizen and enjoyed a long term of very special relationship. In today, interconnected world, humanity faces many challenges and problems that cannot, faced, cannot be faced alone. Rather, we must unite to come up with a pioneering uh, partnership and innovative solution to, uh, to overcome dif difficulties 
and achieve the sustainable development goals and targets. The, Erdi the Indian partnership with the United Nations, in addition to the many cooperation programs and technical support to the developing countries, which um, uh, embody the optimal form of South-South cooperation, give us the best example on the successful partnership required to achieve the SDG. Now, let me talk about my beloved country, Yemen, focusing on food security issue. I am certain that most of you, if not all, you are aware about the current situation in Yemen. The statistics and figures about Yemen echo in almost every relevant UN report or event. Thus, I will not go into details on statistics or indicators, and I would rather try to focus and highlight the food insecurity crisis in Yemen. And the ongoing conflict is certainly uh, the most common explanation for it is the food in the insecurity and looming uh, famine. Though a closer look at the situation in Yemen reveals that there are various uh, in the lying driver at play uh, that have exacerbated the humanitarian crisis and prolonged the conflict in, in Yemen. Chief uh, of those or among us, uh, those restrictions, uh, um, among us, those uh, problem are the restri uh, restrictions on humanitarian access in the Houthis control area are depriving the most vulnerable groups of receiving life-saving assistance. The Houthis have, you know, as you know all, have a particular uh, trouble record on, uh, of uh, obstructing aid agencies from reaching civilian uh, in need. But also, uh, Yemen used to, to heavily uh, depend on the grain import from Ukraine. The conflict in Ukraine has given and raised to additional disorder to the planting, harvesting, uh, transport, and export of major agriculture uh, commodities from the Black Sea uh, region, as well as the prices goes up and uh, uh, ac the access to the essential input like fuel uh, it became difficult. In addition to the uh, heavy humanitarian toll, uh, this conflict severely damaging the food security situation in all uh, countries. And in this regard, I seize this opportunity to thank India, which has guaranteed Yemen uh, an, an exception form to, uh, uh, to, to uh, 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 sorry, an, ex uh, an uh, exception from the new grain exporting uh, measures, which shows a great example of Indian constructive role in restoring food uh, availability, which will enable the Yemeni in need, uh, the, the, the people in need to release their right to food, of which will help in turn in attending the SDGs. Yemen will be always grateful to India, which reflected the brotherly relationship that span the ages. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I now invite the resident, the UN resident coordinator in India, Mr. Shombi Sharp, to say a few words. Excellency, External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. Jay Shankar, um, distinguished foreign ministers, ambassadors, UN colleagues. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you this morning on behalf of the United Nations team in India. Ye vivad bahat mehav purna hai. This is an incredibly important discussion. In the words of the Secretary General that we heard uh, earlier this morning, in this time of crisis, partnership is needed more than ever. And in the eight years left to achieve the SDGs, India is increasingly showing the way, as we have heard from a powerful array of speakers. With one-sixth of humanity, with the fastest growing large economy, with the world's largest, most promising youth generation, and a leading voice for multilateralism and development for all, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, India has the potential to be a game changer for the Agenda 2030 at the global level. 
Not only was India one of the key shapers of the 2030 agenda, but we are seeing an increasingly wide recognition of the Indian experience of SDG localization and achievement, leaving no one behind, driven by world-class public digital infrastructure. As the UN resident coordinator in India, I have a distinct privilege to travel across the country, village to village, state to state, and to see firsthand this innovative Indian development best practice emerging that is so valuable experience for other countries across the world. The famous phrase, as we often hear, incredible India, usually conjures up beautiful images of intangible cultural heritage, of, of natural beauty. But the incredible India that we're talking about here today refers to an incredible development journey. And the United Nations has been so honored to be a part of that journey. During the pandemic, we saw the power of India's digital health platform driving the world's largest vaccination program. And as we've already heard, and I, like many of you in the audience, was vaccinated due to that generosity in a country far from India's borders. We saw also the solidarity with the country through COVAX and even vaccinating so many of our UN peacekeepers across the world. And India has emerged as a leader in climate action and climate justice. The Panchamri targets announced by the Prime Minister, Mo uh, Prime Minister Modi at COP26 are ambitious in meeting energy requirements through renewables by 2030. While the Lifestyle for Environment Life Initiative, also launched by the Prime Minister at this World Environment Day, seeks to transform consumption habits at the individual level globally. Colleagues, as we've heard here today, India has been a strong supporter of multilateral efforts to address climate change, to build resilience, including so many initiatives like the International Solar Alliance, bringing capital to development countries for a green future, and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI, and a range of development and humanitarian assistance initiatives through so many different South-South cooperation platforms, including the India-UN Development Partnership Fund that we have heard about. And of course, we must not forget that India has been the greatest contributor to UN peacekeeping troops since the very beginning. So to close, with India as a global partner, I am very confident that even in th these incredibly challenging times, we can and we will have a path towards a green, sustainable, and equitable future. This is the spirit of Azadika Amrit Mahotsov. Bahat Danivan. Thank you so much for your remarks. I now invite the, our prominent representative for presenting the closing remarks. Thank you, Sneha. <coughs> I have many people to thank, so kindly bear with me. I will begin by thanking our external affairs minister for gracing the occasion with his presence. Sir, your vision and direction continue to inspire us and guide our work here in New York. Thank you. I also thank the UN Secretary General for conveying his wishes through a written message. Our gratitude also extends to the President of the General Assembly, who despite his responsibilities during a hectic General Assembly high-level week, made time for this event. I take this opportunity to reassure him of India's constructive contribution and engagement during UNGA 77. I'm also most grateful to the Deputy Secretary General for attending the event. We do look forward to working closely with her and her team in coming years towards fulfilling Agenda 2030. I would be failing in my duty if I did not thank the foreign ministers of all our partner countries who are here with us this morning. Excellencies, without your participation, this event would not have been complete. I reaffirm India's commitment to strengthen our partnerships, leading towards a prosperous future for our countries, including through the India-UN Development Partnership Fund anchored in New York City. We are also much obliged to the UNDP Administrator for his participation at the event. Our collaboration with the UNDP, which is a cornerstone of the India-UN Partnership, has been growing in strength 
under his leadership, and we look forward to deepening it further. I would also like to acknowledge and deeply appreciate the participation of my fellow permanent representatives, senior representatives of the United Nations, members of the UN Secretariat, and the permanent missions to the UN, and friends from media and civil society. And I cannot miss our partner in crime, the UN Resident Coordinator of India, Shambi, and your team, who have worked very hard with us in mounting this event. Thank you. Lastly, I'm indebted to Team MEA, both here in the mission and in New Delhi, who were behind all the hard work in planning and executing this excellent event. Thank you very much to GSUNP Prakash, to GSUNE Srinivas, and of course, I cannot complete this without thanking young Amarnath from the Indian mission, who ensured that everything was just ship shape today. Thank you also to Sneha, kudos to all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone, for joining, both in person and online. Namaste, and have a good day.